Okay, so uh, um, good evening. Um, I'm Adam Farquhar. I'm head of digital scholarship here at the British Library. And uh, my job tonight is to uh, uh, welcome you uh, to the library and to chair tonight's artist talk and uh, panel discussion. So first part, welcome. Um, it's really lovely uh, to see you here. Um, uh, these sorts of events are always a bit mysterious. You never know who's going to show up and who not. And um, it's lovely to have a, a, a nice full room, but it's not so full that we can't breathe at all, um, which happens sometimes in this room. Um, and I'd like to note also, if you're here for uh, the, the talk and discussion and you want to join us in the main building for the Algo Rave that starts at 8 o'clock, you will be welcome to do that. Um, I have been authoritatively told this should be uh, perhaps the largest algo rave held independently in the UK, and in any case, it's definitely the largest one to have been held in a library in the UK. <laughs> okay, in a national library in the UK, um, uh, and that starts directly after um, after the discussion we have um, here tonight. So I lead the digital scholarship department, and one of the real joys of uh, my role here is getting to know and support. Um, artists, researchers, entrepreneurs, and others who want to work with our digital collections and data. And some of the most exciting of these engagements have been through the British Library Labs, uh, which has been supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation for the previous five years or so, and is now being carried forward by the library. Um, and the labs has uh, really enabled us to do more of this kind of work than we had ever dreamed of being able to, including working with some standing artists, uh, such as Michael Takeo Magruder, who worked with us to create the Imaginary Cities exhibition, uh, which um, has opened uh, just yesterday. So tonight, Michael and his collaborators, Drew Breaker, who will be joining us via Skype, um, David Steele and Mahendra Mahay, who leads the British Library Labs, are going to talk about their work together um, that led to the creation of these new works of art um, displayed in the exhibit, which was opened by Carol Black, the chairwoman of the British Library, um, last night. So I'll just briefly introduce the panel. Uh, first is uh, Michael. He's a visual artist who works with new media, um, including real-time data, digital archives, immersive environments, mobile devices, and virtual worlds. And one of the things I really love about uh, Michael's work is how it combines advanced digital practices, algorithms, and data with um, uh, traditional materials like gold leaf and beautiful woods. Um, and, and the way he bring, bring brings those two together is, I think, um, exemplary and, and really outstanding. Michael's also an artist in residence at the British Library, um, where he's been researching our digital map archives, uh, which are manifested in the exhibition. Um, as well as uh, the million images from our scan book collection. Drew Baker, <clears throat> who's uh, there, there in the corner there, um, uh, is an independent researcher uh, based in Melbourne, Australia, um, hence the Skype. Uh, his work focuses on visualizing archaeology and cultural history. He's helped to establish some of the internationally recognized principles uh, for using computer-aided vis computer visualization uh, for exploring cultural heritage, and he's currently working with remote communities of indigenous, indigenous Australian elders um, to digitize their intangible cultural heritage. Uh, David Steele, um, to Michael's left, is a computer scientist and currently principal architect with Crunchy Data in the US. Uh, he's well known for his contributions uh, to the poker the Postgres open source community and scalable database um, utilities like PG Backrest. David's code um, that was created for this project um, of Michael's uh, is to my knowledge the first software um, to be exhibited publicly in the British Library and I very much hope it's not the last um, such. <clears throat> and uh, all the way to the uh, end of the panel there is Mahendra Mahay. Um, he leads the British Library labs uh, where he supports and inspires artists, scholars, entrepreneurs, educators to use the British Library's digital content, digital data um, in quite innovative ways uh, which um, are exemplary, exemplified actually both by the Alga Rave as well as the, um, uh, the exhibition um, that, that recently opened. So 
Uh, Mandra is uh, also sharing what we've learned in these last five years working in the labs with a network of national, state, university, and public libraries around the world. And we hope that this work is going to really transform the way people work with these digital collections. Um, and he's done an amazing job of nurturing and growing the amazing labs community, um, some of whom are in the room here, uh, and more of whom will be at the Algo Rave um, afterwards. So um, that by way of introduction. Now I'm going to ask uh, each panelist uh, uh, to come up and speak, uh, starting with Michael, who will um, uh, talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, probably, probably a little less. <laughs> I'll, I'll step up when it hits 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and then, so uh, the talks will take about an hour, and then um, we'll have about an hour for open discussion and <coughs> questions. And I hope we can use that to explore, you know, what it means to create art that's simultaneously digital and physical, and that's both data and aesthetic figure. Okay. Well, thank you, Adam, and thank you all for coming. Um, first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself to give you some context of what I do uh, and why I do it. So really for the last 20 years, my practice as a visual artist has exclusively used computational systems, networks, code, data in the production of the work. And of course, works like these often um, uh, start on the screen. Sometimes they exist online. I'm well known for doing various internet art projects with places like turbulence.org and rhizome, kind of back in the day, the heydays of networked art. And with people like, actually, uh, this is a collaborative work with uh, D. Baker and D. Steele. So this is one of our early collaborations together from 2005. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> uh, looking at sort of producing real-time, three-dimensional creations for the web. This is uh, Vermal, Java, and Flash working together. So that's, that's funny. <laughs> Didn't even think about that. And other projects that I've, I've led, um, again, David and Drew have been involved in these, um, working in sort of shared virtual environments like Second Life, Open Simulator, um, Games Worlds, to um, and these synthetic metaverses. And of course, a lot of the work that is produced for the online community does exist and stay online and get sort of uh, access through browsers, whether it's um, a web browser or a virtual worlds browser. Um, <clears throat> but for the whole of my career, I've really been wanting, I, I, I've tried to get the digital products, the digital creations off the screen and into a real environment. And, and one of the ways that I did that <clears throat> was I, I think about using the, the potentials of the media itself. So. This is in 2001, um, sort of early broadcast digital video, where you see here single channel becomes multi-channel, becomes that's London's first video wall in Leicester Square that I was invited to use. So it's a very kind of painterly thing happening in time where I'm using the power of the media to kind of iterate across different contexts and situations. Um, <clears throat> and my work then, again, bringing it into a physical space I, I engage in spaces like a black box environment, you know, uh, and often when I do, and if I'm working with data, I'd like to show the data. So this is a virtual city that, again, <laughs> um, David, Drew, and myself had produced. Um, yeah, we can just cut all the lights. That should. Okay, okay, that's that's good. Thanks. Um, where you see the virtual city that's there in real time. That's been that's being generated by live market data. Um, but sort of having the viewer see the data come in and generate the artwork, that's very important to me. I like to be very transparent in my process of creation. Um, and bringing virtual worlds into physical space. This is a project that I actually, we all worked on, and this ended up in fact in Liverpool. So black box environments, performance environments, blending virtual and physical performers. This was a project that uh, I led at, at Hellerau, the birthplace of modernism in, in theater there at, uh, in Dresden. And architectural spaces, you know, spaces that are both sort of secular, whether it's a beautiful old architectural building or a modern warehouse environment, sort of bringing art 
digital creations into these kind of unexpected spaces, both secular and, and religious as well. I've done a lot of work in old church spaces. And of course, the white cube environment, the gallery. As a visual art you know, artist, this is kind of the, uh, the home of visual art. So again, if you look at these shows that I've done over the past 20 years, um, it is very much the language of visual art. I think in terms of painting, photography, sculpture, video, installation. But if you take away the computational process, you take away the data, the networks, the code, you basically have a room full of nothing. So um, producing you know, with the language of, of traditional visual art, but kind of trying to take that and merge that with things that are born digital. And with that in mind, I really kind of think of myself less as a maker of things and more of a remixer of culture. And I, I, when people ask me, oh, well, you know, what do you want to produce? I think, well, I think about all the beautiful things that I can make. And I do try to make my work seductive and beautiful as a way to kind of get people to engage with it. Um, but, you know, beauty in itself, it's, it's, it's not what really interests me. I want to use art as kind of a platform for dialogue and critique to kind of surface different things. And if I'm thinking about data, often what I'm trying to do is to get people to see data differently. Now, for this particular project with imaginary cities, it's about getting people to see archives differently and the potential of archives. So now what I'm going to do, that just kind of gives you a bit of a background about myself. And uh, as uh, Adam said, this is a long-standing project. You know, we've been going three years together. More, more than three years. Yeah, we passed the three-year mark. Um, and the first two years, I, I was basically artist in residence in labs and digital scholarship. And we were exploring a lot of what we would possibly do. Um, so what I want to do, at the end of that residency, uh, we made a little project video. It's about six minutes. I want to play that because, of course, after, after this, this sort of talk, we can go over and you can see the show. But it's really kind of nice to give you a sense of where that exhibition comes from. So this video should do it. My name is Michael Takeo Magruder. I'm a visual artist and researcher who works with information systems and technologies in the production of my artwork. My project with the British Library is called Imaginary Cities. It's an arts project that looks to take information and data from historic urban maps taken from the 18th and 19th century and use those as the exclusive source material to create these fantastical cities and urban scapes for the information age. The outputs that I had proposed for the project were things that would be physical forms. Much digital work remains digital and remains on the screen, and that's something that really doesn't interest me too much these days. For me, as an artist, I think about creating things that can exist in a physical space that are tangible objects. And for me, this was also a nice way to hark back to the history of maps as being these precious, singular items and things. So of course, in terms of looking at what I might produce and what I ended up proposing, it was things like digital prints, using laser etching systems, 3D printing systems to create physical things, and then even maybe experimenting with combining technologies, taking, say, the latest generation of digital print systems, but merging those with old technologies and old techniques like gold and silver gilding, bringing the analog and the digital together. In terms of the parts of the project, the outputs that would remain digital, for that line of work, I propose to look at sort of the leading edge of what is possible in terms of consumer, prosumer virtual reality systems. So developing these procedurally created cities that would exist in three dimensions over time using various games engines and in terms of the display systems, multi-screen projection and VR headsets like the Oculus Rift. 
So to take these old plans, these old city maps, and then rework them algorithmically and make them into not just 2D plans, but experiential 3D environments. There were quite a number of challenges that I first had to overcome working with the Flickr 1 million images from Scanbooks collection. The first of which, which was quite significant, was actually identifying the, the assets that I wanted to use, good quality maps, relevant maps, the way that you actually can use Flickr's API to search through the collection. It's not straightforward. But working with Mahendra and his team, we eventually found um, the right methodologies for us to extract these high quality maps of major European and North American cities. And from that, we were able to reduce the 1 million to about 2,000. And at that point, I just did a manual sifting in the end. Over the course of the project, I brought in two collaborators to help me realize some of the work that I needed to do. The first person, he's someone I've worked with many times, David Steele, a software architect and engineer based in the US. With David, I looked to explore this idea of taking the singular curated images from the collection and then transform them in different ways every day. So this idea of taking the singular and creating a, an endless set of iterations of artistic creations based on that single image. And that would change every day according to two variables, the first being the progression of time and the second being the interaction of the public with that image in the collection. Another colleague, Drew Baker, who is based in Australia at present, but he's a leading humanities scholar and researcher that does digital archaeology and virtual reconstructions of heritage sites. And what Drew and I did was take the static 2D plans that David's server application was generating each day and take those 2D assets and extrude them into three dimensions in a real-time virtual game environment. So this idea of taking the map and creating a real city from it. As the project developed, I was approached by Mila Escrova, the director of Gazelli Art House, and invited to showcase the Imaginary City's work. First, I was their resident artist on Gazellio, the gallery's online platform for experimental digital art, where I published visual studies and ideas over a month-long period. We then organized a sharing and discussion event at their London Mayfair Gallery and presented the various physical prototypes and virtual experiments to colleagues from across arts, culture, and academia. And now, as we're developing this work, our aspiration is to bring it back to the British Library and hopefully exhibit it here sometime in the near future. So that was our aspiration. And um, this is what's become. So these were some quick sort of uh, preliminary press images that David and I took yesterday. So you can see how those ideas have now become this. Four major installations, each based on a particular city, um, which is based on a particular map in the collection, and then showing also the collection itself, both in its analog and digital forms. So seeing as I really want you all to come with me and we can actually go see the work, I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna hand over to Drew now. Uh, Drew, are you there? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. No. And seeing as we, uh, seeing as um, uh, we're, we're, you know, the bandwidth isn't isn't good enough coming out out of Australia to uh, show Drew on video, I'm gonna show basically Drew's work with me. Okay, so the piece is now launching, Drew, and it's gonna go through its uh, its rendering. It started. This is so Melbourne well. calling. Melbourne calling. London, are you there? Over. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, are there any Australians in the audience? I need to ask this question now. Yes, there's one. At least one. 
I, I shall not mention the barbaric internet speeds in your country then. <laughs> so, um, skipping that and going on to a lighter note, I think it's, it's, it's what's the time now? It's five o'clock in the morning and it's uh, a balmy 18 degrees outside. Um, so, yeah. So, um, as, um, as I was introduced, I, I work in the, uh, the cultural heritage domain, specifically um, with digital work. Um, or as I like to think of it, um, I'm an archaeologist who's um, too old, fat and lazy to do proper digging anymore. Um, and the connection I have with Mike is we both have a, an interest in, in virtual space and the, the visualization of, of lost spaces or, or spaces that are um, contested, um, which I call archaeology and Michael's art. And how those spaces are used and how those spaces are, are received or perceived is, is very interesting and important for me. And the data um, on which all of those suppositions are made, um, how, the, how that data is made transparent and how that data is um, translated to produce something which can be interpreted and, and looked at um, from a scholarly point of view. So hopefully you can see the kind of crossover between my practice and my practice. And this silence. Yes. <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah. It's kind of difficult because all I can hear is some possibly me in the background making what bleaky side sounds like whale. So Mike um, first spoke to me about, about the project some time ago. And really, the, the idea was, um, we're going to do some stuff with Max. <laughs> Great, well, done that. Right, any other clues? Mm, probably going to be New York. <laughs> OK, um, so we're going to do something with Max, uh, um, and it's going to possibly be New York. So the base idea was that we, <laughs> we would have a map and build an imaginary city. Sounds reasonable. <laughs> then uh, I won't go on, on to Davis territory, but, the, but that map is going to be extracted. You'll have seen some of the, um, the mandalas that, that Mike has produced um, throughout the show. And that's what we start. So we, we start off with um, this image and how can we use that image and only that image to start building our imaginary city? Well, we start off by practically looking at the image itself. And each of those tower blocks that hopefully you're seeing represents one pixel. So one pixel on a flat plane. And the idea is that we can take the grayscale value, the, the RGB value summed, to produce the height of a tower. And obviously, we know its position on, on the x y grid. But that's not going to be very satisfactory if we just had a whole bunch of box from, you know, looking like Minecraft. So the, what other data is there in that map that we can start to use to, to build up? And if you think of it like uh, a DNA strand, each of the buildings will have a unique set of parameters which are drawn from that map. Well, we can start off with knowing what the uh, X, Y coordinates are for that particular pixel, and also know the scale value. So that gives us three. We also know where that single pixel is in relationship to its eight neighbors. So we can start to build that in. We can also start looking at then once we have that data about the relationship between one pixel and the other pixels. So some pixels will be higher, some pixels will be lower. And then we can start to translate that into the, the idea of building insulas or, or small blocks of land with buildings. So our buildings, we come down with a ground floor, which has um, doors and windows. We have the tower itself, which has windows. We have a top or a roof, 
And um, we've just been looking at New York, and because um, like Art Deco, it, we have blades or, or fins inspired by that Art Deco going up the sides, and the style of those will be connected to the, the tops of the buildings. There are other things which you can also do. So Mike has produced some um, concrete textures and the windows and the floor textures for the door. And all of those and the blade uh, positions can be offset both in the X and Y direction. So we're starting to build uniqueness within each of those DNA strands. And then finally, the style of the doors and windows, the top of the blade, which we'll see a link, can all be randomized. So each building is unique or has the potential to be unique because everything is done at a, a runtime. And that draws from that, that sort of DNA strand of 22 different items. So 22 different variables which can go into build, in building a block. So once we have that, then all we just need to do is bring those <coughs> blocks into the city. And start to lay them down onto our onto our map, um, our abstract map, um, as the city itself. There are some problems with that. Um, when you start to lay them out, you need to build in roads. So we need to set out a city grid. That's, that's wonderful. We can do that and place that in. And then, because we are interested in in going back to that that or data and still being true to that base map, we used a QR code of the um, actual map on the um, British Library repository to you start to build up the, that kind of city block feel um, with spaces and, and void. And using that, we end up with um, some foundations or pathways on which the, the city blocks sit and those voids we fill them with parks. So you can see how each individual element starts to, to build up on each other. And so from that app, we can generate the entire city. And then some other details, uh, parks are surrounded by benches, which again, we use the similar DNA or subsection of, the, of that DNA strand to build the, and they reference the map as well. And to finally bring it all back to New York, we have a, a real-time, say real-time, um, we have a day, a daylight route which is set um, to the spring equinox because we need an equal day-night time to look at for the longitude and latitude of Times Square. If you're interested, it's the 17th of March, um, 2019, which is set to. So we built an imaginary if not an imaginary city, certainly an imaginary neighbourhood for New York for that day, based on a historical map. That about it? Yeah, and they've um, drew just to say that um, while you were talking, the city I had it running um, from runtime generation. So uh, one other thing to say is that this is the city for today tomorrow it will be different because what the interactions in the collection, you know, David will talk about that, that next, but how people are interacting with the collection um, combined with the, the flow of time progressing, combined with my instructions for the intermediate data production, you know, all that stuff is feeding in to make a map plan through David's application, but he exists for one day. Drew's Unity 3D program, which here, I mean, is running on this terrible sort of corporate PC, but, you know, you can kind of get a sense of it. Um, it, is, it is tapping into David's server. Um, it is getting that map plan, and like Drew was saying, it he, the, his program extrudes it into 3D with the kind of building blocks. So you've seen kind of it go through the runtime, the generation, and now it's doing the uh, doing the fly through the you skyline can, view. You can see it at the beginning, um, when it was actually drawing the city plan, the underlying data was the base map yeah. that was coming from the server. And then it overla over, overlays the generated map on top of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a really privilege to to work with Drew because um, often I <laughs> I come to Drew and I'm like, I want to do this, and, and Drew says that's not possible. I'm like, well, yeah, I know now it's not technically possible, but you'll find a way. I have faith in you, and he kind of yeah. grumbles. Yeah, 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 he grumbles, and then sort of like. Two weeks later, he's like, well, I found the solution. I was like, see, I told you so. <laughs> I never ask things of you, Drew, that I know that you're not capable of, of coming up with solutions for. And they really are amazing solutions. Um, one of our last virtual world projects together, um, I did a show a few years ago called Decoding the Apocalypse, which launched at Somerset House. And um, one of the pieces in that called A New Jerusalem uh, which was visualizing the city, the, the imaginary city of New Jerusalem in, in the book of Revelation. Um, we won the Lumen Prize for virtual art that year in 2015. Um, so Drew really is the, the best of the best when it comes to this online 3D content creation in real time. Um, and he's pushed the possibilities of what you can do um, in a procedurally generated environment on prosumer hardware. Very impressive. So is there anything more you'd like to add now, Drew, before we, I guess, jump over to David? Um, mm, uh, so um, well, that's very kind of like to say that um, one of the reasons I like working with Mike is because um, Mike can be challenging. Um, no, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> Um, so, sorry, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. Um, so, so Mike is always interested in pushing the boundaries of, of what is possible. So working with Mike does give me the opportunity to step outside my normal frame of reference. Um, you know, mostly when you're, you're dealing with, the, with this kind of material, you kind of know what the outcome is. You, you know the procedures which you're going to go through. But working um, with... Um, an artist with humanities material is really liberating because Mike will say, can it do this? And you go, no, he can't do that. Um, and then you go away and you think about it. Well, can, you, can you do it? Can you do it? Well, I can get it to 90% of what Mike wants or I can fake it. So it, <laughs> for, for me, it's one of the pleasures of working with Mike. Okay. So I'm going to shut down the, the virtual world now before it sort of uh, burns up the system here. It might blow Don't up. Don't you actually. kill the New Yorkers? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, somebody did ask of, you know, why there are no, you know, they were like, oh, it's such a beautiful experience. And there are, and there are no, but there are no people that I'm like, and then my, my reaction is like, that's why that's a beautiful experience. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're all inside the building. You just can't go in. Okay, so should we pass over to David? Absolutely. Good evening, my name is David Steele. I'm a computer scientist based in the United States. I have been working with Michael now for 15 years. Uh, the very first time I had been doing some extended travel and I spent about a month with Michael at the end of that travel and uh, he had this code project for me. He's like, could you do this? So I was like, oh yeah, that's easy. I mean, I, I've done this in one form or another many times. I can, I can write it. And so in my head, that was a one-off deal. You know, I was gonna write this code and it would, I would hand it to Michael and I would walk away. But nothing's ever so simple, of course. Uh, <laughs> that code is still running to this day. Um, it's been through multiple iterations. It's been archived by Carnegie Mellon yes. now. Uh, so, and, and it forms the basis for, you know, a lot of Michael's work over the last 15 years. Um, it's quite a simple program. It just goes out to the internet every day to major news sources and pulls articles and um, pictures, you know, relates them, stores them in the database. So for any particular day, Michael can go back for the last 15 years and pull relevant articles from that day, relevant images for that day, um, directly into his artworks. And as I said, it's been running for 15 years. So once I realized this wasn't a flash in the pan kind of project, I started thinking about longevity, uh, how to keep software running for long periods of time with little or no maintenance. Uh, I have a day job. 
So for, for me, this is a hobby and I can't just be running around, you know, putting out fires and fixing things all the time. So clearly using open source was the basis for everything since I'm an open source developer, I think in that way. Um, you know, I picked operating systems and languages and databases that I would be, knew would be absolutely stable, that would not change over time, that would allow Michael's works to continue working uh, with, with minimal um, involvement from me. Uh, we've had a few failures in this area, um, particularly in the web space. Uh, HTML is, is notoriously fragile. Uh, anything that says Web 2.0 is notoriously fragile. These are things that need to be maintained constantly in order to keep working. Uh, in my line of work, we maintain. You know, uh, software maintenance is a part of the job. We're constantly maintaining software, keeping it running. For Michael, we like to keep things as simple as possible. Which brings me to the architecture for this project. Uh, Michael approached me almost three years ago about this. Uh, he comes over to the U.S. usually once a year, sometimes twice, and I come to the U.K. once a year. And that's when we do a lot of our discussing and planning. So, and I wrote the code in... Uh, what was it, January 2017, mm. um, the, the first iteration, the prototype. So this it had all the features that it needed. It wasn't polished. Uh, the automation wasn't really there, but it, it, did, it did what it needed to do so Mike could get his work done. And so I went with our standard kind of open source stack. We used Perl for the code. We used uh, Postgres for the database, as we've always done in the past, and, and the, the actual operating system is Linux. Uh, Ubuntu in particular, if anyone cares. So, so the, the, but the purpose of the software is to take the maps from the British Library collection and transform them in a way, uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's a mechanical thing, right? So, um, you know, Michael likes to use the example of Saul DeWitt who would actually write instructions for his artwork mm -hmm. and then just hand it to the gallery. And they would then follow those instructions and produce the work. And, you know, his only involvement was actually to write the instructions. Yeah. So the first step of the uh, processing for all of these works is is a set of instructions that um, uh, takes the image from the original map, digitized map, right? Not the original map, but a dig digitized version of the original map and converts that to the base data, which is used for, say, this New York project uh, for the pieces that you'll see in the gallery. Um, there are a couple of steps here. So there are purely mechanical steps uh, based on the day. So we move the image around based on the day. Uh, and then Michael has, for each work, produced a, a set of filters that the data's run through. This is simple stuff. So if any of you know Photoshop, this is like unsharp masking, uh, intensity correction, things like that. Just to get all these different maps that were produced at different times in, in, you know, with slightly different techniques to a, a fairly consistent set that can be used to produce works. Um, uh, in addition, we, we add small perturbations. Uh, so I, I've, I've been told not everyone knows what this word means. Maybe it's an American thing, but a, a perturbation is a, a, a small change to a system from an external source, right? So it's not a big change, but it's a, it's a change and it's coming from the outside. So you're not self-perturbating in this case. It's something that's like coming from, from the outside. So what we do to uh, produce the perturbations is we use the metadata from the, uh, um, the collection and in the form of the view counts, which change sort of incrementally from day to day, and the keywords, which various volunteers have actually added to the maps to uh, give them some context. As Michael was saying earlier, you know, if you just have a million images sitting around with, uh, you know, no context, no labeling, then what do you do? You can't really just, humans can't just go through them one by one. Uh, we don't have that capability. So, so the keywords are critical to finding this is a map. This is a map of London. This is a map of Paris. This is a map from this year. This is a map from this book. All of that is in the metadata. So what we do is we take that and we put it through. All right, I'm going to ask really quickly, are there any computer science people in the room? OK, a few. Anyone know what a cryptographic hash is? Oh, wow. OK, cool. So <laughs> that's awesome. That, that's, a, that's a better ratio than I was expecting, for sure. Um, <laughs> but the idea of the, the cryptographic hash is, it's, um, in our, for our context, it's a great way to make um, random seeming data out of uh, uh, any input. Um, in, in a practical sense, in the real world, one of the things it's used for is uh, um, passwords. So if you actually have a password for a service, they'll take your password. They'll, they'll run this algorithm against it, and it'll produce a unique string of text 
that they can store in the database. And, and so they're not storing your actual password, they're storing this sort of process version of your password. It's one way, you can't go back the other way. So once you have this, this string of characters, you store that, and when the user presents you with their password again, you run the same algorithm against it, and you don't match the passwords, you match the hashes. If the hashes are equal, then you know, the password is correct and the user is allowed in the system. These days, it's actually quite a bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic underlying idea. But for me, um, hashes are a great way to produce random looking data that's reproducible. Uh, one of the things that is a, a constant theme in my work is reproducibility. Uh, the idea of if the inputs are the same, the outputs will be the same every time. You know, we test this, we think about it. I've developed numerous techniques around this and it's the underpinning idea of pretty much everything that I write. So this is something that I've, I've you know, brought to Michael's work. I'm like, this absolutely has to be this way all the time because otherwise David won't be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael loves it too, don't get me wrong. Like this is not, it's not like we have a fight over no, this. No, no. Uh, Michael loves the idea. So in this case, the great thing is you can take the, the inputs, which are the, the view counts and these keywords, just mash them together into a piece of text. It doesn't matter how you do it as long as you do it the same way every time. <laughs> You run it through, uh, in particular, we're using the SHA-1 hash. Uh, SHA-2 seemed like overkill for this particular project. So, and sha one's readily available. And then, and then you have what looks like a random stream of 20 bytes. And then we can use those 20 bytes to um, make slight movements to the actual daily position of the map. We can use these 20 bytes to make uh, slight perturbations to the uh, filter inputs. So Michael has defined the set of filters that will be used and the, and the settings for those filters, but daily will just slightly modify those up and down. The other really nice thing about the hash is that users can't game the system. So, you know, in theory, if, if it was just based on, say, view count incrementing, the user would know, well, hey, if I, if I view this page three times today, it's going to do this thing to the image. Um, but because we're essentially randomizing the data, they can't do that. Mm. So they can, they can change the output, but they can't change the output in a predictable way, um, which we think is kind of fun because it's just... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to, to, so to a large extent, it, you know, it's, it, it's fair to say that the, you know, the bulk of the work and the bulk of the presentation is, is the way Michael has said it, um, but the users do have the ability to make these very small changes, which, are, which makes it kind of interesting and fun and interactive. And I didn't set a timer, so I'm not really sure where, where I am. Okay, well then, then yeah, I'm doing pretty well then. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, one thing that's pretty, I was gonna bring this up on GitHub, but let's not do that. Uh, so the, the, the code for this project is actually open source. Um, if you go out to Michael's GitHub page, it's Michael Takeo Magruder, or M Takeo Magruder, github.com. Um, you can go look at the source code. Uh, if you wanna look at a little bit of the source code, you can see it in the gallery. Um, but unfortunately, that's only the first page and the last page, so, you know, you're, and the first page is pretty much all documentation and help, so you're not really going to get a lot out of that. But if you're, if you're curious, if you really want to know how this works, you just go look at the code. The code doesn't lie. And, and just to say that if, even if you're not a very technical person, my code is generally pretty well commented. Yeah. Uh, so you can really just follow the comments and actually see what's going on step by step. Um, and if you're slightly technical, then you might learn something you know, from looking at the comments and the code and, and kind of having an idea how the project works in general. All right. Sorry. Oh, did I? Oh, let me go get my water. Hello, everyone, um, and hello, Drew. Drew, I've still got that. I've still got that DVD that you lent me, <laughs> and I haven't watched it, so I feel very bad. So I apologise right now. Anyway, What's a DVD? <laughs> you gave it to me at Michael Schmooze. You probably don't remember. Anyway, um, so um, my name is Mahendra Mahay, and I work at the British Library. I work with Adam in the Digital Scholarship Team. And I've been running a project called British Library Labs um, for about six years. And in essence, um, my colleague, where's Eleanor? And my colleague, my colleague Eleanor um, Cooper, 
and I can see some advisory board members in the audience tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, um, so we've been running this project for about six years, and in essence, what we're trying to do sounds really simple. Um, we're trying to get people to do interesting things with our digital collections and data. That's it. Sounds really simple, right? And we've been spending six years trying to do that. And we've been working with researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, educators, actually anyone who is interested and has some energy to bring to our collections. We invite them in and we start discussions and um, we, we talk about potential ideas that people could, could work on. And we've done that in lots of ways over the years. We, we, we ran a competition, an international competition. Um, we also run awards, a bit like the Oscars. Um, <laughs> we, um, we have an, uh, an annual symposium every year where we, we recognize exemplary work in various categories. So research, artistic, commercial and educational categories. We also have a staff award, by the way, which has been fantastic. And it's really to kind of highlight what interesting things people are doing with our collections. Um, how many of you in the room have actually used our digital collections? Okay, not um, a few. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Obviously, you have taken it. And I'm sure Drew's putting his hand up as well, right? Um, oh, I'm, I'm not in the room, so I don't count. Yeah, no, you no. <laughs> You're you omnipresent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just it's kind of weird hearing you with a, as a voice coming from up high. So anyway, um, so um, but anyway, um, we um, so this is this is what we try to do, and um, I, I I I give lots of talks in the UK and around the world, and we we we. We rock up at an institution or an organization and we try to sort of tell people about the library and often people have lots of misconceptions about the library. They have certain view, ideas that we kind of have to debunk. So, for example, one of the major things that uh, shocks people is that actually compared to our physical collections, um, our digital collections, are, are for example, the stuff that's actually digitized from the physical is actually quite small. Does anybody want to have a guess how much? It's about 3%. Okay, but it's a 3, three um, and you know, with the British Library, we have a lot of stuff. So, you know, that 3% is actually a really large number. But anyway, um, so, so over the years, um, we've been working on lots of different projects. Our website, if you Google British Library Labs, you go there. Um, it looks like a simple page, but when you dig into it, you'll see lots of evidence of things we've done. I think over the last six years, we've probably worked on about 150 projects. And what's really good about that is they're much more powerful ways to inspire you to come up with your own ideas. So what I'm really hoping about today, for example, somebody in this room is going to be inspired by, for example, what Michael's done. Um, but you can visit the page, you can look and explore those collections, uh, uh, the, the ideas, and, and, and we provide links to our collections. So we have a portal called, called data.bl.uk where you can download large chunks of data and start experimenting and playing. Um, but I'm just going to sort of, um, how long have I got, Adam? Two minutes. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be very quick now. So, um, <laughs> So um, I met Michael well, a long time ago, so it's about three or four years ago. Mm. And as I said, we started a conversation. And um, we, we, we worked. Uh, so the sort of magic ingredients were energy and doggedness, I would say, um, and determination. And I think I was really inspired when I met Michael and the work that he was doing, and it seemed like a really good fit for the kinds of things we were doing. And really, what I, what I, what my job is to do is to try to inspire people to start doing other things. So what I'm, what I was hoping with Michael was that we'd end up working on something that would then inspire somebody else, and we create this virtuous circle. 
So then somebody else does something, and then that inspires somebody else, and so on and so on and so on. And so our collections, this investment we've made in our collections and digitizing them and capturing our born digital collections, like websites and so forth, um, you know, we get a kind of return on investment. We spent all this money, you know, who's actually using it? What are they using it for? What inspirational things are they using it for? So anyway, so with, with Michael, Michael got particularly interested in a collection called the, the, the uh, One Million images from scan books collection and i think michael's now come up with the name that's that that is the definitive name i think it's yeah. been called lots of different things this is a collection of images that were snipped out of books digitally so you can relax um and uh we put them online on Flickr. and really the idea was these were images taken out of books and put uh, online with the idea that people would start to identify them um, 50,000 of those images were identified as maps by volunteers. It was, it was just an incredible effort. I think over the last six years, about 17 and a half million tags have been added. The images have been seen over a billion times. Anyway, it was the maps that uh, piqued Michael's interest. And uh, those 50,000 maps drilled down to 2,000, and eventually he chose the four. And then he then created these beautiful artworks. And I think for me, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with an artist because they see the world a bit differently. And um, it's, it's just been, it's been, a, it's been a really long journey, but um, I, I'm, I'm actually genuinely proud of the exhibition and it'll be fantastic for you to see it. Um, and I, well, I'll just finish by just saying that, um, I, and I mean this very sincerely, a lot of our projects start with a conversation. So if you've been inspired by anything tonight, you can talk to me or um, um, Adam or um, Eleanor. We're gonna, if, if you go to the Algorave, okay? That's a little bit of a little hint to go there. Um, and um, we start a conversation. And, and that's actually really what it takes because People need to understand the collection, the collections we have, and also understand the institution and how, and how we work and the priorities that we have and the things that we focus on. But I think I'm going to stop there because of time. And I'm going to sit back down and I'm going to go back to um, and go back to the so, so um, If we can turn up the lights in the room. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so uh, now time for questions and discussions. What I'd like to do, if I could, is take a couple of questions and then let the uh, panelists uh, uh, think about and address them while you think of your next set. So if we can have a, a first couple of questions. And if you don't leap in, I'm going to back, back in, in the back there. That's one. And the next one. Um, we're going to take two in the back and then come up to you. Um, hello. Um, I guess this is a question from Michael. Um, you've talked about your projects exhibited in a black box environment and also a white cube gallery. So I wonder um, anything particular you want to share with us exhibiting in this library space? Okay. Um, uh, just, let's, I'll let's wait. just yes. grab the second <laughs> question and, and then... Um, yeah, what uh, data sets that aren't publicly available would you really like to get your hands on that would inspire you or your art? Okay, so the first question about um, the, the uniqueness of showing in the British Library, um, it's an amazing space. It is the only gallery space that I've shown in that has three entranceways into it, which makes a very unique challenge of it, you know, in, in most gallery environments, you have a defined entrance and you have a defined exit. And if you want to build, as an artist, a particular narrative, as you're leading people through a story, um, you have a path you can send them through. Uh, now, that might seem trivial, but it's, it's really not, especially when you're trying to not only talk about a project in terms of my own artistic ideas, but you're, you're sort of bringing in collaborators they're, they're sort of bits of a story. You're talking about a collection. You're talking about, um, in many ways, I was trying to showcase you know, what is possible now through the last 20 years of digital research that's been done at the library. So that's a pretty complicated story. 
a lot of different stories coming together to make this super narrative and people can walk into it in three different ways. Um, that was a challenge. We had a wonderful designer for the show, Martin McGrath. He really is, he, it is a privilege to work with Martin. I've done, on, done so on several occasions. And Martin had a really nice way of actually taking my works, the collection items, the digital collection itself, and, and, and finding a way to kind of navigate, get people to navigate through so any entrance way would make sense. But it was a big challenge. Second question about data sets. Yes, data sets. Um, well, the collection I worked with um, and that I was immediately drawn to was the one million images from Scanbooks collection because it was online and freely accessible. And there really wasn't any other choice of things that I wanted to, to work with because there was no other big collection that was just so accessible in public facing. Um, so what I would love to see from the BL is more collections like that. Um, and if, if more collections like that get, get basically released and supported by the library, I am sure I will you know, dive into those. And, and what those will inspire me to do, I don't know. Um, but I do know for me to be interested in, in them, um, they need to be like the Flickr collection. We need to have access. I'm, I'm not interested in coming into the library, even though I can with my research, you know, my staff pass, and, and, and just sort of work on things that I can only do here. I want, to, I want to tap into the outside. I want to work with something that everyone can work with. Question here, and then the next one after that. Yep. Yep, no, he's here. Um, have you ever tried or played with texture generation for kind of growing new maps out of out of the images that you've got, but that kind of look? I guess similar to what you start off with. Do you want to talk about feature <laughs> creep? <laughs> so that brings up a whole subject. Let's just take a second question. We'll, we'll okay. okay, yeah. yeah. You're going to end up answering this one as well, actually, possibly both of you. Um, so the code is available on GitHub, the maps are available on Flickr. What are the things you, can, you would like other people to do with them that either you didn't have the time or didn't have the inclination to do? And also, how could the code be improved if it's on GitHub? What are the things that you would like to have done that you didn't have time to? Um, these two questions actually sort of go together in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me, I'll, I'll start here, and then I'll kind of go into uh, your question. So the, so the answer is yes, actually. Uh, Michael in January. So I spent the entire winter in uh, southern Africa. I don't like the cold. Okay. So I go south for the winter, um, and so I was traveling and working. But, and, and Michael comes to me and says, well, I'd really like to, um, you know, Michael found the, uh, the code that, some of you may have heard about this, there's a, a piece of code out there that will take, um, you can use it for many things, but in this case it had been used, the training sets were classical paintings. Uh, and someone generated a classical <coughs> painting that was completely algorithmically generated and it sold on Christie's for 150 pounds or 150 euros, I can't remember. Um, and, and the original author was just a little bit upset <laughs> <laughs> about this because he's like hey you know I put this thing on the internet for free and then you know it's been monetized in this way so um, you know Michael had encountered this and I had I had seen it the year before because I'm always interested in these sorts mm -hmm. of things and so he came to me he's like why don't we why don't we use this to generate um, you know new maps uh, you know completely imaginary maps uh, using the British Library maps as the training sets and I said yeah that's lovely I don't have time for that um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I'm the guy with the, the, you know, the day job that isn't art. <laughs> Michael's day job is art, my day job is, is not. Um, but I said, you know, this is something that would be really interesting to explore for the next iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Michael's works are never really done. You know, they, they grow and they change and they morph over time. So we're definitely considering that. Um, this is what uh, I'm always telling Michael when he comes up with the ideas. In, in my business, this is called feature creep. So when, the, uh, when they keep saying, could you just add this thing? How about if we move, yeah. 
No. So I take a pretty hard line on these things, and uh, and I, I thought that we were well scoped for this particular project. Yes. But next time, uh, we're definitely considering it. Um, I have looked at the code. Uh, it's written in Lua, which is kind of odd, but hey, everyone's got their thing, right? And <laughs> so maybe maybe you'll see that uh, uh, within the next year or so. Uh, which brings me to your question, um, which is obviously an outgrowth of that. That there are all kinds of places you could go with this. Um, you know, the uh, in this case, uh, particularly because this other code base already exists, um, it's also open source, just like our software is. Um, I'm certainly not going to rewrite it uh, in Perl. Um, you know, Perl's kind of a Swiss Army knife. It's a great language for just kind of knocking things out. Um, it's easy for everyone to read. It doesn't have to be compiled. Uh, it runs on a variety of systems. So, you know, but for something, uh, for this particular um, use case, it's not a very good language. So it, what we would do is be taking the original Lua code, actually calling that from the Perl code. So using Perl still as the top automation, um, and then just, you know, adding whatever command line parameters we need to the Perl code, and then calling out to the Lua code base to actually, uh, um, you know, generate the, um, the neural nets based on the training data, and then to actually generate the, uh, you know, the images uh, going forward. Now, now, to be honest with you, we have no idea what these might look like. Uh, so it's a bit of a, you know, a, first of all, a research project just to, I mean, just as we did uh, at the beginning, you know, yeah. Michael had this idea, we discussed it, we developed it some, and then I, you know, I went and coded it to see what it would look like. And, you know, and developed the prototype. And this would be the same kind of thing. We'd have to make sure, you know, that we might yeah. have to, we, we almost certainly would have to process the inputs in a different way than we do for the, uh, the intermediate data that Michael uses. Yeah. More than likely, but, but we don't know because, because we haven't tried. Uh, but that's the, the main thing we're thinking about uh, adding I, as we I go forward. Yeah, so I, I, I drew whether you have a, um, a thought related to that question as well. Yeah, um, I think the big, big one for me was I'd really like to put in um, real time weather. Um, we have data streams that are available um, to be able to pull down um, you know, what's happening in, in and around Times Square weather-wise, and we can sample that every 15 minutes. But um, it was really out of the scope of the project. And there's some technical issues. How do you compress that data down? Do you use historical data sets? Mm. You know, we're running on 24 hours in 10 minutes. It's a bit problematic um, yeah. to, to chop and change the weather. But the, all of those hooks exist within the code. It would just be a case of, of wiring them up. So if there was one thing which I was, would have liked to have added was to bring in a different a complementary big data set um, to, to enhance the world. I mean, saying that, it might just all end up as a big puddle um, <laughs> because that's an awful lot of data to be processing and we're already pushing the envelope. Like, Michael. Yeah, um, well, you know, I don't ask you to do anything that I, you know, know you're not capable of finding the way. <laughs> One in the back and another question? <clears throat> Am I? Okay. Another one in the back. Hi, I have, a, one. I have a double question actually about the project Afterlife. Uh, one is whether um, the video rendering will be available once the gallery will come to an end. And the second is whether, well, with the, uh, with the exhibition at the, uh, at the Somerset House on New Jerusalem and this uh, imaginary cities, you, there's clear in, clearly an inclination for urban spaces. <clears throat> mm. But I was wondering whether there is some um, scope for uh, um, ecologies or moving away from urban spaces and uh, using this as a starting point for something you know that might be even conceived as or, um, imaginary uh, worlds where you can integrate mm. I don't know ruralities into into the virtual space thanks actually I think this follows on from that and as much as I mean a lot of all the source code all the sources that you're building on or kind of 19th century Western, the, the British Library's collection mm -hmm. is inherently Western. Mm -hmm. And, they, and you know, using the QR codes, for example, as part of the grid for, for the city feels absolutely like you know, early 20th century America. Yeah. Um, I just wonder what happens if you use a different set of sources. And I'm thinking of pre-modern cities and non-Western cities yeah. that aren't that kind of weird grid. Well, I'll, I'll start with with that, um, when I started looking through the collection, 
my first plan was to pick cities from around the world and that is what I really wanted to do and it wasn't possible because they're not in the collection. Well, um, they, they are just, just the, the, not in. We, we really struggled with we, it. Yeah. yeah, we tried to make this work, but unfortunately the maps for a lot of the, you know, they either the, they were too sparse. Um, you know, we had to have a bounding box to like clip out the parts. So they were too sparse. There wasn't things. enough data there. Yeah. They were very small. Um, in some cases, the, the maps were uh, obviously hand drawn rather than, you know, it just. Yeah. Yeah, we really tried um, with more effort. We might be able to find. No, I, I works, honestly, I don't think they exist in the collection because... Or, or, or we have to change the methodology because yeah. we actually sort of had settled on the methodology before we picked the final maps. Mm -hmm. um, and the methodology was chosen based on Paris, London. I mean, originally, those two. And so it, there may be other ways the data could be processed that would, mm -hmm. that would uh, be kind to the, you know, the, these, these more basic maps of, of the eastern cities. Um, sparser maps, if you will, less, mm. there's less data there, there's less density, there's less, it, yeah, but we, you know, it'd have to be a different process, I think. Oh, well, it'd also have to be a different collection, because I honestly, I mean, I, maybe well, I didn't tell you this, but no, I did actually look through mm -hmm. for eastern cities, um, and I just couldn't find them, and I went to um, the digital map curator at the time, Dr. Phil Hatfield, um, and I said, what's up what's up with this and he, and he then he said well it's you know basically a lot of what you're finding michael is coming out from um guidebooks yeah so it really is looking at that transatlantic you know the rise in that sort of mid 19th century rise of a new middle class with money that could travel in the guidebooks and it was all about western cities we found some stuff we had remember we had delhi we, yeah we found we had a Beijing. few we had, things we had belém in, in brazil yeah we had yeah, but it was few and far to, between. To, to be honest with you, even even for those time periods, New York and Chicago took a little bit of creativity mm. to to find you know parts of those cities that actually worked well yeah. uh, in this methodology. And that was you know those were, were denser cities by far. Yeah. It just yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was tough. That was the original goal. Mm. Um, and, and in particular, I really fought for it for a long time because I just wanted to you know, have more representation. I travel a lot, so I yeah. think about, but, but this wasn't in the cards, I, maybe in the future. I, I will um, uh, do two things. I'm gonna shift you to the second question, but I'll, yeah. I'll just make a, a little comment about that. Um, so um, the collections do cover in great detail cartographic information mm. about many parts of the world, mm. collections. But that particular digitized collection was drawn from a particular set of volumes that was selected, you know, for a particular project um, uh, at a particular time, and that didn't happen to have that flavor because it was looking for um, uh, it needed European languages um, because mm -hmm. of, uh, and, and so on. So it was it's sort of a, an interesting observation. This is part of what Mahendra refers to as the conversation is to figure out how um, non-representative of the overall collection um, any particular digitization activity is. This is that 3% selection maybe of the overall um, collection that you're seeing that's been digitized and that's often been done for quite surprising and often interesting reasons um, but won't necessarily give you the effect that you thought that you wanted. So I'll just mention that and then just um, this comment about um, uh, question of, non about non-urban yeah, spaces. spaces and I think you partially addressed it in saying you know you would need a different methodology mm -hmm. um, but have you you know perhaps you have a thought about what that would be or what that would mean well maybe Drew could talk about um, because we've done a lot of projects where we've really looked out to, to build a world um, so do you want to address that Drew um, yeah I mean I think one of the big challenges of working with with certainly earlier European maps is they're already illustrative. Um, they are not re the, 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 um, abstracted, if you like, so they're, they're not literal or trying to be literal representations of what's on the ground. And that's something which I think we, that the project was trying to do was look at the, the mon if you like, the mundane plan of a, of a city and see what could be abstracted out of that. If you look at um, 
early um, European maps and um, um, I think of um, some of the Japanese maps in Nagasaki, which are European maps, but of Japan, and the trade maps, they're all illustrated, so you have everything in perspective. So I, I, I think, yeah, a, a different approach would be needed to that, to, to be able to take a, an abstracted image out of that. Um, for, the, I mean, for me, the big challenge would be to take much more organic um, data sets um, and be able to manipulate those. I mean, the idea is fascinating. Um, I mean, so I, I can build stuff that has formulas because that's what we use. So if we're looking at, say, um, Vitruvius um, or um, um, I can't remember the group's name. Um, let's call him Hierophant. Um, that's not the right word, but that'll do. Mm -hmm. um, who designed Para, they're, they're all based on mathematical progressions. If we start looking at, say, um, the migration patterns of wildebeest, which would be a really interesting um, thing to look at, taking from um, that, that natural ecology. Uh, and trying to impose rules upon that to see what we came out with. I think that would be really interesting, but it's, it's a very different approach and, and out of the scope of the project. Okay, thanks. So um, we're coming just about to the end. If we have a last question or two. Another one after that. No, okay. Okay. I was wondering whether you have ever worked with uh, words, with texts, um, and with different languages, really uh, being in a library, whether texts have uh, ever inspired you? Yes. Um, yes, text. Uh, I work with text a lot. Um, the first project that comes to mind, it's, oh, when did I do it? I think 2003. I did a project which I called World. And it's it was a um, a two the, the end result were these large 2D digital paintings, which got printed out on Duratran and put on the wall. And it was the word world in the native script of the top sort of like uh, 30 or 40 languages um, by sort of like number of people that speak the language. Uh, yes, but that wasn't strictly looking at text. Um, so I, I did that project, and that project then, a few years later, Drew and I took the base of that project and then did another one called Worlds, which actually took those sort of 2D sort of constructions made out of the single word and then extruded those into uh, 3D kind of like sculptures, each one. Um, Lamentations for the Forsaken, which uh, Mahendra just mentioned. Um, projects like Imaginary Cities, I like to look at sort of the beautiful, the potential side of data. Um, there's often where I look at the sort of the darker side of data. So I did a, a project a few years ago looking at the Syrian refugee crisis. And that one, I was using the names of, um, of Syrians that had died in the conflict. And it was, it was a project that was uh, uh, commissioned for a Stations of the Cross exhibition. So it took the iconic sort of Turin Shroud image and digitally remade that um, as this, from this textual weave of all, all these names of victims of the war. So I, I do use text in my work quite often. Um, I just not here. Well yes, yeah, yeah. Which that that like first one that which all three of us worked on. Yes, I can think of several. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just just not this one. Yeah, yeah. So, just not this one. Actually, interestingly, text is frequently integrated into Michael's work. Yeah, just not this one. Just not this one. <laughs> not <laughs> this one. Not the one at the library. Not the one at the library. Yeah, <laughs> but you did. You did. But 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 Michael did insist on actually printing out the source code. And, and, and getting that as an object into so the library, there, there as a go. manuscript. That's, that's text-ish, yes. texty. 
Thanks so so I, I think we've come just to the end of our time. Mm. Um, thanks so much for a really interesting set of questions and discussion. If we could uh, please thank our, our speakers, panelists. Mm -hmm. And if we could also thank the lovely audience uh, as well. Um, so uh, uh, thanks so much for being here. And um, uh, please, if you want to join us at perhaps the UK's largest ever algo rave at a national library, please um, uh, do so with the main library just across. All right.